I V M. Folks, welcome to Paisa Paisa. I'm your host Anupam Gupta, the 50 on Twitter, and this is a blockbuster special. A lot of you guys have asked for this guest, and I'm glad that he's finally here. My guest is Saurav Mukherjee, founder and CEO at Mattelis Investment Managers. He honestly doesn't need any introduction at all. Well, in fact, so many of you have asked me to bring him on Paisa Paisa. <laughs> And the reason I have not been able to do that is because we've been busy writing the book for the last two years. Um, see, now I worked as Arup since 2014 as a consultant, but more recently for the past two years, I've, I've really had the honor to be part of his research into outsized professional success in highly competitive uh, industries and professions. And our book is the conclusion of this research. The book is called "The Victory Project: Six Steps to Reach." Peak potential. It's out on delivery starting today because this podcast is going to this episode is going to air on 17 August. So go to Amazon, Flipkart, or wherever you buy your books from. Order your copy, and we're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about a whole lot of things today, and we, you know, let's. Uh, so on this episode, we'll talk about the basic concepts, how they pertain to you, your life, and most importantly, your money, guys. Okay, I know this podcast is called Paisa Paisa. The book is called The Victory Project. Believe me, if you. Follow what the book says. You will see a transformation in your personal finance and in your life. There's an entire chapter dedicated uh, in the end on this. But without further ado, sort of welcome to Paisa Paisa. Thank you so much for joining us today. There's a, I you know, I've lost track of how many people have wanted you to be on this show. Maybe not for the topic that we're talking about, but irrespective of that, let's start with the book. Why exactly did you write this book, and what got you interested in peak potential? Go for it. So, so thanks, Arupam. Thank you for inviting me to to uh, Pesa Vasa. I've heard about a lot about it over the years. So glad that I'm finally able to to be on the podcast with you. Uh, like you, I come from a middle class Indian family, and and the core ethos that is drilled into us from an early age is that we should study hard and get a good job because otherwise, you're told your your whole world will fall apart. So in my teenage years, my conception of what it took to hit peak potential was quite narrow. I have to concede that in my teenage years, I took a very narrow view of the world. But as I progressed through my personal life, right, first in the first in the UK and then in India, uh, as an equity analyst, I saw that most of the successful promoters and most Uh, you know, highly successful financial investors, uh, the people who are at the top of the tree, so to speak, they were there not just because of academics, but because they had very consciously cultivated a range of other skills, skills which can only be built through through focused effort, right? So, just to take an example, in the Victory Project, we've shown that fund managers like Mo- Mark Movius and Professor Sanjay Bakshi, uh, they're not just voracious readers of finance literature, but also of material pertaining to the Arts and spirituality. When you and I were interviewing Harsh Mariwala, I saw that his library was well stocked, uh, not just with books on FMCG uh, or on management. He also had books on on psychology, right? Similarly, one of the most interesting things I found when we interviewed promoters for for the Victory Project, and I remember this also was true when we interviewed promoters for Unusual Billionaires, uh, is that their ability to concentrate fiercely. on on the subject at hand for an extended period of time so for example if you remember on a year or so back when we interviewed sanjeev bikchandani of yeah. info as is at his residence on a saturday afternoon right this is a billionaire you know he's he's he doesn't have any really need to focus so ferociously on the interview yet the meeting lasted for over 90 minutes uh, not once during that time did he you know look at his mobile phone or respond to his you know his emails or his text messages or did he entertain other visitors right he was fully focused on the job of hand which was to tell us about his journey of building nokri.com and info uh, ditto with our meeting with uh, purva purohit of uh, radio city right and that's why i find peak potential to be such an interesting subject the ability of highly motivated people to train their minds through voracious reading through spirituality through clutter reduction mental clutter reduction these are things which have been of interest to me ever since i published unusual billionaires uh, four years ago in 2016 and you know really glad that i got a chance to pull this together with you and look into the subject in depth in the in the victory project yeah i, I remember all those interviews way back in 2016 i mean good I've kind of lost track of the people that we had met, even for the for for the unusual billionaire from some from you know from Sandeep Engineer uh, in Ahmedabad to 
possibly the biggest banks here in Lower Perel. And in fact, I just got a response from somebody on Twitter who actually posted an extract of Sandeep Engineer's anecdote that was there from the book that that you had written about how he had faced failure in the start and he used to go door to door selling something. So that's yeah, I mean you're right about that. So now while the book discusses how everyone can train their mind to hit peak potential in the you know in in the con- in in the context of investment professionals, someone like you, or even people that you work with, say as analysts or investors uh, in the stock market, how is the book useful, and what are the implications for people working in financial markets? The tendency I've seen amongst investment analysts, and, and I, I was no exception uh, uh, when I was you know ten, twenty years younger. The tendency of investment analysts is to believe that their success or or lack thereof is down to hard work. They want to work hard on reading annual reports, on building their financial models. Um, And you know, all of that is very laudable. But the reality is that if you want outsized success as an analyst or an investor, you necessarily have to see the world from angles that other peers can't even imagine. Right. If you're doing the same old, same old of slogging away on annual reports and spreadsheets, you know, that's not that's that's necessary. But the essential prerequisite of success is you have to see the world from unusual angles, from undiscovered angles. You have to discover perspectives which others haven't discovered. Uh, to make it a little bit more dramatic, you have to take your mind to places that no, no one else has been to. So the question then becomes, how do you do that? How do you how do you train your mind to see things others can, can't even imagine? So quoting from the case study that we put together on Mark Mobius for the Victory Project, he says, travel has played a major role in shaping my investment philosophy in general and my worldview in particular. He says further, travel opens up your mind. You have to open up your mind because you're confronted with, with different people, different images, different environments, and you're not going to survive very long if you're close-minded. You have to be willing to learn, uh, explains Dr. Mobius in the in the case study. And this is a specific anecdote. He, you know, this great investor is now 82, 83 years old. He's, he's almost defined emerging markets investing in the last 40 years. And he, he, he gave us an ep- uh, anecdote uh, uh, about his traveling to Japan. This is Japan back in the 50s and 60s before it became uh, an economic giant. He was a scholarship student and he told us, I was staying with a family in Kyoto and their way of life and their outlook was so different from me, an American American uh, 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 child, that it was quite a big lesson for me. And you know, this is what I find interesting about peak potential. You reach peak potential from traversing paths that others uh, others haven't traversed. In the Victory Project, I've also narrated my personal experiences where meeting other thinkers over dinner or drinks gave me the kernel of the ideas which now define Marcellus Investment, uh, invest, investment Managers, right? So for example... I first learned about Rob Kirby's 30-year-old paper on coffee can investing over over dinner with friends in 2013, right? I remember this was in, uh, in Phoenix Mills in 2013. I was having dinner with three other fund manager friends and they told me about coffee can investing. Um, similarly, the idea behind Marcellus's Little Champs portfolio came from reading reading the German management consultant Hermann Simon's book, Hidden Champions of the 21st Century, four years ago. And the recommendation to read that book in turn came from my from one of my earliest gurus in London, uh, uh, economist called John Kay. So reading widely, traveling extensively, socializing with a range of interesting people is as central to success in financial markets as, say, reading the annual reports, you know, really, really closely. Yeah, I... Yeah. My favorite uh, anecdote sort of is uh, Ramdev ji from Motiyal Oswal. This is a person, you know, who came from really humble backgrounds, mm-hmm. didn't know, didn't even know how to uh, write in English, but knew that if he had to crack his CA, he, he would have to learn English and good lot, the kind of efforts that he did and the learnings from there. So folks, um, you know, this is not just about financial markets. It's about a framework for learning. So sort of we covered the financial markets part. Mm. What about our listeners, you know, who who work in a walk of life that's really far away from market? What can the book tell them? So look, I think I'll give you world exclusive here. Uh, Two thirds of the victory project has nothing to do with uh, finance and investing. It might shock some of your listeners, but uh, we are making a genuine attempt in this book to go well beyond finance and investing. In the first three sections of the book, we detail out what we call the simplicity paradigm, which is a a six-part framework for for achieving peak potential. So the simplicity paradigm has two layers. The first layer, the foundational layer, focuses on, on specialization, on simplification, and on spirituality. 
The second layer of the paradigm, the more advanced skills are clutter reduction, creativity and collaboration. Right? Each of these six steps are then brought to life using case studies which have nothing to do with finance and investing. These are case studies ranging from uh, uh, from Bruce Lee to Abraham Lincoln uh, uh, to Satyajit Dre uh, to to uh, uh, say the world of world of taxi drivers in in central London. Right? Um, it's only in the final section of the book that we have uh, chosen to use. Uh, case studies from finance and investing to illustrate the simplicity paradigm. So we delve into say great companies like Amul uh, or, and TCS and into the, the thought process of great investors like John Bogle and, and Rob Kirby. But even in the final final section of the book, Anupam, we use case studies of great music directors like R.D. Burman and A.R. Rahman to highlight the relevance of the simplicity paradigms to professionals in every walk of the life, in every walk of life, right? And throughout the book, throughout the book, from the uh, the prologue through to the epilogue, we track the evolution of two characters: uh, Akanksha, who's a senior VP in a, a multinational company. And Suraj, who's a rookie investment banking associate. Now, obviously, these people's lives uh, uh, echo, uh, mirror many of our lives, our challenges, as you and I have built our careers in 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 this in the maximum city. But the adoption of the simplicity paradigm by Akanksha and by Suraj provides a narrative that we believe anyone from any profession can identify with and benefit from. Yeah, folks, so that's your exclusive out there, that two-thirds of the book actually have nothing at all to do with, uh, you know, with markets and investing and P-E ratios and what to buy, what to sell. In fact, I have lost count of the kind of references that we have out there. I When I was researching for this book and when I was writing uh, my sections, I remember quoting from, you know, from Star Wars, from Kung Fu Panda. I, it's just all over the board. It's just, you know, such fun writing. This book. So, folks, we're going to take a small break out here. On the other side uh, of this break, when we come back, we're going to look at what we do in our lives versus what's written in the book. And finally, I know a lot of you guys have have so many. You know, the one of the most asked questions I'm sure that sort of gets gets is what exactly are his recommendations. So, don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back on this really special episode. I'll call it the Victory Project special on Pesa Pesa with Saurabh Mukherjee, founder and CEO at Masculine Investment Managers. We'll be right back. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IBM Podcast Network. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Been a really fun week on the network. Please do definitely check out all the regular shows that you do. But in addition, let me give you a few recommendations. On Agla Station Adulthood, Ritasha and Ayushi talk siblings. Really fun episode. I think you'll enjoy that. Nishad Pai Vaidya is on Cyrus and they discuss uh, hey, cricket and a lot of different things around cricket. I think you'll enjoy that as well. Old friend Parmesh Shahani, he was on Absolutely Right. Definitely do check that out. Tamal Mills was on Edges and Sledges, another episode which I've heard really good things about. I haven't heard it yet. I need to listen to that soon. And guys, Uncle Please Sit. Definitely listen to that. They've been killing it. This week they have Abby Phillips. He's Dr talking about medical misinformation. Last week, Paramita Vora was talking about sex education and who needs it. They've been really killing it. Definitely do check that out. And with that, let me get you back to your show. And welcome back to this blockbuster special on Pesa Vesa. My guest is Saurabh Mukherjee, founder and CEO at Marcellus Investment Managers. We are talking about the recently released book, The Victory Project. On the first part of this episode, we spoke about how the book has a framework of people in the stock market, outside the stock market, and why uh, sort of got interested in the topic of the book. Now, in this part of the episode, we're going to get this really personal for you guys. We're going to talk about how, you know, what you are doing and how you can actually hit peak potential. So, sort of welcome back. Let's take it from here. Okay, so mm. if you had to contrast the six steps in the book with what most people actually normally do in their lives, what are the biggest diversions that people actually do that stops them from hitting peak potential? Now, that's a really interesting subject. And if I look at the, you know, my, my social circle and if I look at even my own life, the two biggest deviations between the paradigm that we're expounding in the book versus the real world, I would say the first one is reading, reading widely and especially reading books. I think what the rise of social media and the internet has done is it's destroyed the ability to, to concentrate on a book for an extended period of time. So people find they can concentrate for a few minutes 
uh, but they can't concentrate say for an hour or a couple of hours which is what you really need to do to get immersed in a book not only does this hamper your ability to read books uh, but leaving that aside the fragmentation of attention also hampers the ability of people to do deep work right and most successful people in any walk of life whether it be doctors or sports sports stars or fund managers or business owners most successful people i found are able to maintain fierce focus on complex material for extended periods of time and then that's become a real challenge for for the vast majority of us because you know our minds have been pulverized by by the rise of uh, social media and then internet and the fragmentation of attention uh, due to smartphones has i think become a real challenge for many of us i would say that's the de- first deviation the second is collaboration right uh, uh, especially in our country we grew up in a society where the modern cult of achievement is very much built around the individual it's basically a- ayn rand's philosophy on on steroids right uh, people have been taught to believe that they can succeed in highly competitive professions by riding rough shot over over other people and if you look at it just think about it a little bit more the exam oriented education system that our country has further encourages you know this side this type of thinking right after the age of 21 all you are doing is topping in exams and doing well in exams obviously you grow up thinking that i me and myself is the whole world right unfortunately in the real world whether you want to build a great company a great product launch a successful fund or compose great music all successful endeavors are necessarily collaborative right rd burman is a legend not just because he trained himself to become a world class composer but also because he convinced the best musicians in bombay to play their hearts hearts out for him and he also convinced the the biggest producers of the 60s and 70s to back him with seriously big bucks right success in the modern free market economy is the collaborative endeavor not a solo effort and i think a lot of people spend the best part of their careers figuring out this enigma of the of the free market that by collaboration we achieve success not by running solo yeah and i remember when we had met manish abarwal in bangalore uh, and you talk about reading uh, if you recall the kind of place that we had been to i think out of the four walls four walls of the room that you were sitting in three were completely covered absolutely floor to ceiling with books i mean it was just mind boggling and it showed the way he was talking with us the 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 sheer range of anecdotes and examples that he was giving us absolutely I remember about he could quote verbatim sections of yeah. it was just mind blowing right that gives you a sense of the how how powerfully his mind has been trained to to focus on complex material and retain material which he can then almost regurgitate at will when the relevant time arises right that is a massive skill it takes years to cult- cultivate yeah. that and it's cultivation of those skills which drive peak potential Yeah and I think that you know you hit the nail on the head out there I've I've lost track of how many people we you know I meet in personal life and everywhere else who flaunt the number of books that they read and reading is a great habit no issues you know I I honestly I I admire them but what I remember about Manish and like you just said right now that first is reading then is quoting from there at the right moment in the right perspective you're right that kind of skill is not easy it takes huge effort and in fact now that's you know that's that's actually the last last question of this recording uh, of this episode because and i'm sure you get this a lot wherever you go uh, what are your recommendations you know that in in your view what would be the three most useful books that you read to build you know that that you read when you were building the men- the mental models while researching the book i know that the book has got a lot of references for a lot of books but if you were to choose three useful books what would they be So I think, given the amount of time we spent in the last two years pulling this together, let me give you the sort of the, the books which were most helpful in helping us uh, build the mental models which shape the the, the victory project. Um, so I think, first of, I remain a big fan of uh, I think Malcolm Gladwell's writings. He's one of the best writers, non-fiction writers in the planet. But I have to confess that Range by David Epstein uh, uh, blew me away. It was it was really influential in helping us. organize a thinking on the specialization which is malcolm gladwell versus generalization which is david epstein and i i think we've tried to reconcile these two uh, uh, points of view that you should specialize in one thing and do it for 10000 hours versus being a generalist but i think david epstein in range has done a brilliant job of of reconciling gladwell's philosophy with his own own point of view another pair of books which for, which formed uh, which provided great mental frameworks for the victory project were uh, originals by adam grant 
uh, you know, three, four year old book. And then a, a 30 year old book, uh, Creative People at Work by Doris Wallace and, and Howard Gruber. Uh, although the books are you know written 30 years apart, both of them provide really, really deep analysis on the underlying drivers of creativity, which have fueled the greatest minds in, say, the last 300, 400 years. Uh, and I think whilst you and I must have gone through 100 odd books to clarify our thinking around the simplicity paradigm, the two biographies that, that stood out for me in helping helping me clarify my thinking around the paradigm were uh, Avargis Kurian, Damul Founder's biography, autobiography, in fact, I Too Had a Dream, uh, uh, I think superb book on how something uh, uh, the size of Amul can be built from the ashes of 1947 when there was basically no company, there was no Amul, to a company which today, which is three times the size of Nestle India. So Nestle India's market cap is $20, $22 billion. So you can imagine if Amul were listed, how big a powerhouse it would be. And the other biography which was very useful was Bruce Lee, uh, Bruce Lee, A Life by, by a man called Matthew Polly, a journalist called Matthew Polly. I think super biography of a of a great a great fighter, a great warrior, who in a way simplifies the who in a way exemplifies the, the simplicity paradigm. So I think that would be my my top of the charts. Uh, David Epstein range, originals by Adam Grant, creative people at work by Doris Wallace, Howard Gruber, Varghese Korean's biography, I Too Had a Dream, and Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly. Fantastic, Saurabh. Let's just wrap up with your own books, right? Because this is like, um, it's the, you know, it's the end of at least this journey. I'm sure you've got many more to go, many more books to write. But at least this, what, it's been almost, uh, almost five years since we started The Unusual Billionaire. So just wrap up this entire uh, journey, this entire philosophy that you've taken such a long, you've researched so much and you've built it so much. Just walk our listeners through the, the trilogy. So sure. first, so first of all, you know, okay, actually, I'll, I'll let Saurabh walk our, walk our listeners through that. Go for it, Saurabh. So then we, we, Unusual Billionaires came about because of Rob Kirby's Coffee Can Investing Framework. You know, that, that, that framework led us to around uh, a dozen odd uh, uh, Indian companies who had generated 10x in 10 years, 100x in 20 years, 1000x in 30 years. I'm talking about shareholder value here. And you can imagine, right, if you if you are like Asian Paints and you've generated, what, 1900x returns uh, uh, in 38 years, they were listed in 82. You can imagine there must be an extraordinary story behind it. So Unusual Billionaires, in a way, is the story of these, uh, of dozen or so uh, extraordinary companies who generated enormous amounts of wealth in the 20 years ending 2015. 2015 is when we researched the book, 2016 when this is when Unusual Billionaires was uh, was was published. And that that uh, the, the research for the book um, really got me interested in this subject. So why is it that only a select few promoters are able to see their industries in a unique perspective? Why is it that only Champaklal Choksi saw how he could disrupt the paint industry in 1969 and go on to build a mammoth monopoly. Why is it that only Aditya Puri saw how he could disrupt Indian banking in 1996 and go on to build the powerhouse that is HDFC Bank, right? So that that question really intrigued me. Um, um, uh, we explored in Coffee Can Investing in 2018 the results of, of these great uh, promoters, great CEOs' work, which was the Coffee Can Investing paradigm, which is that the the, the typical Indian uh, H&W, a middle-class saver out there who wants to uh, uh, invest his or her money successfully without falling mercy to Indian fund managers, all he or she has to do is look for companies who meet these two simple criteria, 10% revenue growth, 15% ROC delivered over a decade, and you have the coffee can investing paradigm. But as I finished that book, right, I realized that there was still an, a story which, has it, which we hadn't told, a story which we hadn't delved into, which is the underlying drivers of greatness. What leads to an Aditya Puri becoming an Aditya Puri? What leads to a... Uh, uh, Harsh Mariwala building a, a cooking oil and a hair oil monopoly, right? And that's what we have delved into in Victory Project. And in that regard, the Victory Project brings the trilogy to an end, right? We started with Unusual Villainess, focusing on great companies and looked for you know guardrails which, which great companies use to drive superior performance. In Coffee Can Investing, we sub simplified it into a very easy to use investment paradigm that millions of people out there can use. And in Victory Project, we go deep. We go deep into the mind of these great promoters to understand why they are able to have ideas 
that nobody else has and just as importantly why they're able to turn these ideas into reality into execution in a way that very few promoters have been able to do so and hence the victory project to me is you know particularly satisfactory end to a 780 year period where you know i've tried my best to look for the drivers of outsized success in this great country that we live in yeah so it was absolutely it was so much of fun uh, working with you for the unusual billionaires and now again for the victory project so much that i've learned and you know before i let you go on on the show last question i'm sure that all our listeners want to know you know maybe some some kind of tips some kind of hacks some kind of advice that can help them with their personal finances in general for the last 6 or 8 months god alone knows we've been grappling with these very uncertain times um some of us have <laughs> some of us have jumped into the stock markets head on there was data which came in the papers about how this entire horde of people since they have time in their homes are dabbling directly in stocks trading them and god alone knows maybe stopping the sips or whatever and there are others who are you know probably struggling so on specifically on personal finances could you give our listeners some you know some advice some direction some tips just to wrap up this this episode so now as you know that it's very difficult to sort of give one solution which fits uh, which works for everybody so in the victory project for example the the solutions we create for uh, akanksha who's a you know who's sort of 40 something very senior executive in a in a in a in a well played corporate role obviously the portfolio we create for her in victory project is very different to the one we create for for suraj who's a rookie investment banker in his first job in his in his mid 20s so it's different style different strokes for different uh, 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 investors but if i had to look at my life and and you know give you sort of three foundational principles which i use to run, look after uh, my family's finances the first thing is i try to make sure at any point in time uh, we have 3 years worth of living expenses stashed away in a good fixed deposit or government bonds right because you know i i i work in the stock market i i am i'm a promoter of a small financial services company and therefore i don't know what the future holds for me so i got to buy a basic level of security for my family and myself by by putting away 3 years worth of living expenses in in a risk free in risk free investments in the second way i've thought about our finances as a family is you know we got to pay for our children's university education and my wife and i have to uh, also finance our retirements and therefore the second layer of investing focuses on these two goals i i i i call it the 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 uh, the sort of stability layer first layer was security basics second layer is pay for children's education and our retirement the stability layer and this is where i find my own philosophy i eat my own cooking of coffee can investing Uh, invest in stellar franchises clean promoters essential products very high barriers to entry no speculation no faffing around class compounders uh, form the stability layer of our portfolio right i have a great deal of faith uh, in these companies we've done a lot of research and we are convinced that these can compound at at 20% per us over the next 5 10 20 years and the final layer of the portfolio of our, of our of our financial planning is what i call ambition right so so ambition for me is to basically uh, uh, write more books spend more time reading spend more time traveling and if i am to finance my ambition of reading and traveling extensively rather than managing money i have to have to pay for that so there is a one final layer of our portfolio which is investing in really high quality small caps it forms around 20 25% of the mukherjee family portfolio top quality small caps akin to our literary champs portfolio where we can see that not only are these clean dominant franchises but over the next uh, 10 20 years they could potentially give our give our family returns in the say vicinity of 25% so security through fixed deposits stability through investing in coffee can franchises and then financing ambitions and kind of the good to have things in life a uh, life of leisure reading and and traveling finance through high quality small cap investing and that is folks that is a wrap on this episode this blockbuster episode of paisa paisa my guest sorum kurji founder and ceo and masterless investment managers folks if you've not already signed up uh, for masterless weekly newsletters and the blog posts that right please do the website is marcellus.in i am subscribed and i can tell you it is the finest investment writing that you can get right now uh, and especially the weekend newsletter three longs two shorts which has just such a wide variety of reading remember what sorup said about having an open mind and reading a whole diverse set of topics you want that just subscribe to the newsletters straight away they out 
they're open for the public unlike other people uh, sort of the newsletters also for the pms for little champs whatever it is are all out in the public domain the twitter handle you can also follow the twitter handle which has all of this released over you know uh, on a daily basis whenever this material is out so, so that's a wrap folks i'm you know i could probably record so many episodes with sorov but for for now this is it that was sorov pokarji founder and ceo at marcelis investment managers sorov thank you so much for joining us for joining us and doing this episode for our listeners thank you anupam thanks it was a pleasure working with you and thank you for inviting me to pesa vesa thank you anupam And listeners, if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. You can listen to us on the IBM Podcast app or IBM Podcast dot com. You can also follow us on social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. If you want to reach me, I am B Fifty on Twitter. And thank you so much for listening. Do pay salary. No material on the show should be considered as financial advice. The material on the show is for informational purposes only. Please consult a financial advisor before taking any investment decision. Do you wish you were smarter? Well, so do we. But the next best thing, we could make you sound smarter. And to help you with this endeavor, we are Simplified, Ooh. a podcast uh, that attempts to break down the complex world around you with a uh, little knowledge, a lot of poor jokes, and a ton of random trivia. Episodes out every Monday on the IVM Podcast app or wherever you get your podcasts. See ya. Wish them to ham tumare podcast lagte hai. Naam hai football, shoot ball. Presenting football, short ball, a show about three friends discussing our favorite game over a beer. Sometimes three, maybe even five. Hi, I'm Shiva, and with me are my two sidekicks, Kaurav Sapre and Kartik Ayer. Sidekick? You mean like Batman's Robin, a Van Persie Robin? No, I mean like Alexis Sanchez, but with a little more skill than just playing the piano. Ha! Just shows how the best players at Arsenal are mere bench warmers at United. Oh, thank you, Ayer, but you're a Fulham supporter, so whenever you say anything to support me. I question my beliefs. Just like how Griezmann would say, "Ek baar maine jo decision le liya, to main apne aap ki bhi nahi sunta." Banter aside, we will talk match reports, transfer rumors, top controversies, fantasy football picks, and so much more. So grab a beer and tune in to Football Should Ball every Wednesday on the IVM Podcast app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts.